graphic content. The Atlanta Ripper was a serial killer who is suspected of killing at least 15 people in Atlanta between 1909 and 1914. On July 21st of 1911, a 20-year-old woman named Emma Lou Sharp sat in her house on Hanover Street in Atlanta and waited for her mother to come home. It was a Saturday evening and Emma Lou was worried. Her mother had left an hour before to fetch some groceries and still hadn't returned. Usually this wouldn't be a cause for concern, but these were unusual times. Just two weeks before, a neighbor of the Sharps named Addie Watts was hit on the head with a brick. Then, as the local papers described in mysterious understatement, a coupling pen was brought into play. Watts' attacker then dragged her into a clump of bushes and slit her throat. Watts' murder had been just the latest in a string of attacks that left the local African-American population on the edge. All the victims had been of black or mixed race. All had been young, around 20 years old. All had been women. Emma Lou Sharp fit that description almost exactly, but she was more concerned about her mother, whose name was Lena. Frantic with worry, Emma Lou set out in search of her mother. At the market, she learned that Lena had never showed up. Emma Lou started back for home. In the area that now separates Inman Park from Reynolds Town, she was approached by a stranger who she described later, according to the Atlanta Constitution, as, quote, tall, black, broad-shouldered, and wearing a broad-brimmed black hat, end quote. How do you feel this evening, the man asked Emma Lou. I'm very well, she told the man and began to walk past him. But he blocked her path. Don't be afraid, he told Emma Lou. I never hurt girls like you. Then he stabbed her in the back. Bleeding, she ran away, screaming for help. And Emily's mother? She was already dead. Her head almost severed from her neck. Atlanta's Jack the Ripper had just struck again. Less than a half a century after the Civil War, the Atlanta of 1911 prided itself as the gateway to the New South. With almost a dozen major railroads spoking out from the city, the business of Atlanta was business. Inman Park and Peachtree Street were enclaves for the wealthy. For a select few of the city's African Americans, Atlanta was a model for racial tolerance. Black-owned businesses had sprung up on streets such as Auburn Avenue, local colleges, Spelman, Atlanta Baptist College, now known as Morehouse, Morris Brown, and Atlanta University, currently Clark Atlanta University were considered among the best black centers of learning in the nation. But for most of the city's African Americans, life was hardly idyllic. Most worked menial jobs, installing sewers, perhaps, or cooking and cleaning in white households, maybe, then trudging home at the night to dimly lit neighborhoods such as Reynolds Town and Pittsburgh. And while Abraham Lincoln had given black Americans the right to vote, Georgia, in the early 20th century, actively sought to disenfranchise black voters by methods such as poll tax. Segregation, meanwhile, was not just practice, it was the law. Black people could not be buried in white cemeteries, they could not walk through white parks, they could not drink in white bars, they could not cut white women's hair. In fact, a black baseball team wasn't allowed to play within two blocks of a white baseball team. Nearly five years earlier, on September 22nd, 1906, the facade of racial unity fell away when a crowd of several thousand white men and boys gathered in downtown Atlanta amid unsubstantiated reports that four attacks had taken place on white women at the hands of black men. The white mob went on a rampage. Three days later, an estimated 25 to 40 black Atlanteans were dead. By 1911, the population of Atlanta had climbed to more than 150,000 people, and the white people actively sought to keep their neighborhoods free from black homeowners. That July, white citizens living on Ashby Street gathered in the Emanuel Baptist Church for the purposes of suggesting methods of keeping Negroes out of the vicinity. Already it seemed four black families had moved into the neighborhood, and there were signs that more were on the way. 
The committee decided to visit property owners in the neighborhood who might reside elsewhere and ask them not to sell any of their property lying in that section to Negroes. So when young black and mixed race women began showing up dead, it wasn't cause for much concern in the local papers. Circulating largely among white readers and staffed exclusively by white reporters and editors, papers such as the Atlanta Georgian, the Atlanta Constitution, and the Atlanta Journal were far more concerned about crimes among whites. Black on black crime merited little attention as the Constitution showed in May 29, 1911, when it buried a two-paragraph brief on page seven under the headline, quote, Negro women killed, no clue to slayer, was found with her throat cut near her home, end quote. The brief went on to say that the mutilated body of Belle Walker was found by her sister on Sunday morning after Walker failed to return home the night before from her job as a cook in a home on Cooper Street. But it wasn't until two weeks later after Addie Watts was killed that the newspapers began to speculate that the murders of the, quote, negresses were perhaps the work of a solitary killer. Quote, black butcher at work, end quote, asked the June 16th headline in the journal, although the story beneath it stretched to just four paragraphs. Still, the final paragraph was perhaps the first in the local press that compared the Atlanta killings to the work of London's serial killer in the 1880s, Jack the Ripper. Quote, on account of the number of recent murders of Negro women, police advanced the theory that Atlanta has an insane criminal, someone on the order of the famed Jack the Ripper, end quote. Ten days later, the journal evaluated Atlanta's Jack the Ripper to the front page. For the first time, the paper examined similarities among the crimes, noting that five Saturdays in a row saw murders of young black women. But on the same day, the journal was sounding an alarm about a possible serial killer. The Constitution covered the sixth black woman dead in much the same understated way as before, naming the deceased and concluding after just two paragraphs that, quote, mean whiskey and cocaine are the probable causes, end quote. How can you blame cocaine for a slit across the neck? Still, when Lena Sharp was found dead and her daughter was stabbed, even the Constitution had to admit in a headline that the, the quote, theory of Jack the Ripper is given further substance, end quote. The story underneath then recounted in detail how Emma Lou Sharp came face to face with the man police believed was the Atlanta Ripper. The journal described Emma Lou's ordeal quite differently. However, in a much shriller tone, the paper said that Emma Lou and her mother had been together when they were attacked. After first knocking Lena down with a brick, the man slashed at Emma, who ran screaming from the attacker before fainting from loss of blood. She awoke to see the man standing over her, knife poised, until he was scared off by the sound of approaching footsteps. That's bunk. Quote, while the ordinary Negro murder attracts little attention, the story said, the police department was upon the alert last night, doubtfully expecting a repetition of a long series of crimes which have baffled every effort of the detectives, end quote. Quote, it's the work of the same man, said Coroner Paul Donahoe. On the next day, July 3rd, the journal made a page nine mention that a local black undertaker, L.L. Lee, had offered a $25 reward for the capture of this killer. Meanwhile, papers throughout the country, intrigued by the prospect of another Jack the Ripper, began running wire stories with an Atlanta dateline, quote, eighth victim of Jack the Ripper, end quote, streamed the Sandusky Star Journal of Ohio. As another Saturday approached, the journal asked the question that was on everybody's mind. Will Jack the Ripper claim his eighth victim this Saturday? The story quoted an unnamed veteran cop. It's coming, he said. Quote, the Negro will kill a woman before midnight Saturday, end quote. On Saturday night, July 8th, 22-year-old Mary Yettel left the home of W.M. Seltzer on 4th Street, where she worked as a cook. From down an alley, she heard a low whistle. She stopped, and coming toward her was a 
quote, Negro man, tall, black, and well-built, and moving with a cat-like tread, end quote. Yadel ran screaming back to the Seltzer house. Seltzer met her at the door, then grabbed his revolver. He ran to the alley and found the man still standing there, but when Seltzer told him to raise his hands, the man darted back down the alley. Seltzer called the police, who arrived on motorcycles, but their search turned up nothing. Within days, black churches in Atlanta had fattened the reward for the killer, declaring in the resolution that the, quote, foul and unpunished murders have placed a reign of terror over the laboring class of women of our race, end quote. But the reward was useless. If it was true that the prowler who'd approached Yadel was indeed the killer, his streak of Saturday night slayings had been broken. But he didn't waste any time, evidently. On Tuesday morning, July 11th, a group of men working on a sewer near the intersection of Atlanta Avenue and Martin Street, just west of Grant Park, came upon a large pool of blood in the road. They tracked the blood about 30 feet to a small gully where they found the lifeless body of Sadie Hawley, who worked at a local laundry. Her shoes were missing and her throat had been cut so that she'd been almost decapitated. Clues, of course, were scarce. Police found combs worn by the victim on both sides of the Atlanta Avenue. They also found a two-pound rock smeared with blood. Within 20 minutes of the discovery, more than 100 onlookers had gathered. By 9 a.m., when Donahue, the coroner, arrived, the crowd had grown to over 500 people. Because so many murders had occurred, and because even the police weren't sure which murderers were the result of which killers, some papers called Holly's death the Ripper's seventh victim, while others called it his eighth, and another speculated it was his ninth. In any case, the effect was the same. It caused absolute hysteria. Police patrols were beefed up, but there seemed to be no pattern to where the killer was striking. Newspaper accounts described the deaths, especially since all the victims, quote, with one exception, end quote, were, of course, hard workers, generally respected by both races alike. The character of the victim is largely responsible for the indignation at the murders, which has been so evident among the better class of Negroes. I can't believe we used to speak like that. In an editorial, the Constitution chastised the police for not finding the killer. Quote, what is the matter with the Atlanta police that they have not found the criminals themselves and locked them securely from further depredation? Is it indifference or incompetence? Is Atlanta in need of a police awakening or a police shakeup? End quote. By mid-July, Mayor Cortland Wynn began publicly leaning on the police chief and the chairman of police commission. Quote, why the police are unable to cope with the stint situation is more than I can understand, the mayor said. City councilmen were even more vocal. They said, we need the police department reorganized and put on more effective bases, and we need it badly. Councilman Steve Johnson was quoted as saying in the journal, no doubt the police's impotence was due at least in part to the fact that Atlanta's police department was all white. Within 24 hours of the discovery of Holly's body, police arrested Henry Huff, a 27-year-old laborer. Huff had been seen with Holly the night she had been killed, police said, and was arrested in bloody clothes with scratches on his arms. But Huff was only held on suspicion, and in the same Constitution story that described his arrest, the unnamed reporter seemed fed up. The reporter said the police department had nothing to say in explanation of its inability thus far to cope with the situation further than the simple declaration that it is doing its best. The story went on to say that the white community was aroused over the killings as well. Killings that have served to intensify the servant problem. Faced with the police's impotence, leaders of Atlanta's black community called upon authorities to hire black detectives. Leaders of black churches urged the city council and the governor to set a reward for the capture of the killer. Their petition was endorsed by many prominent white Atlanteans, including Asia Chandler, founder of Coca-Cola, and a future mayor of Atlanta. Not long after Huff's arrest, 
Police also picked up a 35-year-old by the name of Todd Henderson at a saloon on Decatur Street. A man had seen Henderson with Holly the night she was killed in a drugstore not far from the murder scene. Emily Sharp was brought into the station to identify Henderson. How you getting along, Henderson said when he was brought before Emily, who shrank back at the sound of his voice, the Constitution reported. But another paper, the Georgian, reported that her identification was not solid. That's the man, she said initially. Then she qualified her statement, If that's not the right man, I'm badly mistaken. The Georgian, like other papers quoting African Americans, took great pains in spelling out their words in ways that reinforced racial stereotypes, a la Huck Finn. For instance, Henderson was quoted as telling police, quote, Gee, if I was Jack the Ripper, I show sure would have begun on my wife, for she's gibble me lots of trouble, end quote. The case against Henderson grew stronger when he told detectives that he hadn't owned a razor or a pocket knife in a year. But police learned that on the morning that Holly was murdered, Henderson had dropped off a razor at a local barber shop to be sharpened. Although the cases against both Henderson and Huff remained circumstantial, police decided to hand over both men to the prosecutor in hopes that a grand jury would sift through the evidence and decide which men to indict for the murder of Sadie Holly. Nevertheless, police themselves seemed doubtful that he had gotten the right man. On Thursday, three days after the Holly murder, eight plainclothes patrolmen were assigned to night duty, and the police chief, Henry Jennings, explained the challenges the department faced in tracking down this killer. The police department was handicapped, he said, quote, so seriously so, by its small size. But if we had more men, we could not stop crime, end quote. The week ended with Governor Hoke Smith offering a $250 reward for the capture of Atlanta's Ripper. That Sunday, the string of murders was the focus of sermons in Atlanta's black churches. At the first congressional church, the Reverend Henry Hugh Proctor said, quote, This bloody hand points to the sins of the colored people themselves. Our churches are doing good work, but they are not doing enough. They have been getting people ready to die when they should have been preparing them to live. End quote. Proctor called on his congregants to clean up their neighborhoods by shutting down saloons and gambling guns. Quote, Decatur Street is a reproach to our churches in the city. If each member of our church would go down to that street and save one of its habituates, it would be better than all of our praying and singing, end quote. Cleaning up the community, he said, would, quote, make the work of Jack the Ripper impossible, end quote. The racism of the times was perhaps best displayed in the remarks of Na Nash Broyles. A city reporter, Broyle served as a local magistrate. He said, there's no such thing in Atlanta as a Negro Jack the Ripper. Judge Broyles said that at the trial of a black man named Jim Murphy, who was charged with threatening to cut his wife's throat, Murphy was fined $25.75. He went on to say, it's just such cases as these that result in these murders of Negro women, Royal said. I'm satisfied that every one of the several Negro women slain recently in Atlanta were murdered by a different man. There are at least 1,000 Negro men in Atlanta today who stand ready to cut the throats of their wives at the slightest provocation. What a disgusting person. Asked to explain why so many murders took place on Saturday nights, Royals had a pat answer. Saturday night, he said, is the black man's, quote, big night, the time when he tanks up. Over the coming weeks, the murders stopped. But police, under intense political pressure, continued making arrests anyway. In virtually each case, the accused was nabbed based on accounts of witnesses who had put them at the scene of the crime. On August 9th, the grand jury indicted two men, Henry Huff and the new suspect, John Daniel. Huff was indicted in the Holly murder, but the papers would give scant information on Daniel, but said that his was a Jack the Ripper case. On August 31st, more than six weeks after the latest murder described as a ripper crime, 
The Constitution reported that Marianne Duncan, a 20-year-old, quote, Negro woman, was found dead in an area called Blantown, west of Atlanta, between a web of railroad tracks. Like Holly before her, Duncan was found without her shoes and with her throat cut from ear to ear. Despite the indictments of Huff and Daniel, both the media and police were certain they had not arrested the true Ripper. That fall, the murders of young women resumed. The body of Minnie Wise, described by the wire services as a comely mulatto girl, ugh, I hate that word, was found in an alleyway November 10th, her throat cut, her shoes removed, and the index finger of her right hand severed at the middle joint. Ugh. He's a murder maniac, said the chief of police. If we find this murderer, I'm satisfied we will find a remarkable criminal, whoever he may be. By this time, newspapers nationwide were running stories about the Atlanta Ripper. Detectives from other cities offered their services. Mayor Wynn was getting embarrassed. In a letter to one of those outside detective agencies, his office struck a defensive tone. He said, Atlanta is known throughout the country as one of the most law-abiding cities of its size in the United States, and its police and detective departments are second to none. It is true that in some instances criminals escaped arrest from a time, but even escapees of this kind occur in all cities. The letter also outlined the strengths of the force of 200 capable officers and 15 keen-witted and experienced detectives. But just a week after Wynn's office sent out the letter, Atlanta awoke to one of the grisliest murders yet. A woman with her head cut almost completely off, her heart cut out and lying by her side, her body disemboweled. The media attributed the crime to the Ripper and the Constitution on November 23rd ran an interview with an unnamed police detective. He told them, we won't get to the bottom of this thing until we get some help from the Negroes, he said. These murders are being committed along the lower class of Negroes, ignorant, brutal beasts that know nothing else. Their acquaintances are afraid to talk, but if there was a little money slipped, we could find out invaluable clues, and I wager we would land the murderers. But we haven't got the expenses. Ugh. At black churches, pastors advise their female congregants to not venture out at night. Venturing out at night is inviting the monster's ravages. Pastor Tanner told a group of concerned citizens at Big Bethel Church where a basket was passed and raised $1,200 as a reward for the Ripper's capture. In December, Reverend Proctor was still clamoring for black detectives to be retained to help track down the murderer. Meanwhile, Henry Hoff, who'd been accused of one of the Ripper murders, was found not guilty by a Fulton County jury. This means, reported the Georgian, that the police department and the county authorities are as far as ever from the solution to the Jack the Ripper murders. Throughout the winter of 1912, more young women were found with their throats cut, but the pace never again reached the early summer of the year before. In March of 1912, the Constitution reported that the grand jury had concluded that the Atlanta Jack the Ripper was a myth. They reported each murder was committed by a different man. In each case, it was the result of jealousy following immoral conduct. Ugh, talk about victim blaming. But the story, which ran just four paragraphs, didn't explain how the grand jury reached its conclusion, and a month later, the same paper ran a story headlined, Jack the Ripper Turns Up Again. In this case, the body of a 19-year-old girl was found in a clump of bushes at the end of Pryor Street. She had been stabbed in the throat. By the spring of 1912, the daily papers were writing about the Ripper's 20th victim, a 15-year-old pretty girl found floating in the Chattahoochee River, her throat cut, her body mutilated. Although the media wasn't convinced, police kept making arrests. In late April of 1912, a man named Charlie Owens was sentenced to life in prison for one of the so-called Jack the Ripper murders committed in Atlanta during the past 18 months, the Constitution reported. And the story didn't say for which murder he was convicted, 
however, and in a matter of weeks, the papers were attributing yet another murder to the Ripper. On August 10th of 1912, more than a year after the first Ripper murders had occurred, Henry Brown, also known as Lawton Brown, was arrested for killing Ava Florence, who had been murdered the previous November. Brown's wife told police that he had come home successive Saturdays, the same Saturdays many of the killings had taken place, with his clothes bloody and would sit before the fire to dry them out. Under questioning, Brown revealed intimate details of the other crimes. Detectives believed they had found their man. But did they? That October, Brown went to trial for the Florence murder, but John Rutherford, identified by the Constitution as, quote, a Negro, testified that police had put Brown through the third degree during questioning. Rutherford said, detectives chained Brown's arms to a chair and then struck him in the ears until he confessed. For his part, Brown said he often suffered hallucinations and would admit to almost anything under pressure. On October 18th, Brown was acquitted. Try as they might, Atlanta detectives could not convict anyone of the Ripper murders. Vance McLaughlin first heard about Atlanta's Ripper murders when he was researching a book on a serial killer in Buffalo, New York. McLaughlin is a former Savannah police officer and today is a criminal justice professor at the University of North Carolina in Pembroke. Unfortunately, McLaughlin says finding primary documents about the Ripper case, indictments, death records, police reports, is a big challenge. Many just simply don't exist. If you look at the Wikipedia page on the Atlanta Ripper, there's basically nothing there. The newspapers of the time were notoriously unreliable. Each paper would ascribe a different number to each murder. So while some papers claimed that the Ripper was responsible for 20 murders, another might say he'd killed 21. McLaughlin says the hysteria created by the murders may have inspired a copycat killer. Or it's possible that someone with murder on their mind simply used the same technique that was described in the papers to divert suspicion to a non-existent serial killer. He explained that if you were going to kill a black woman during that time, you'd certainly do the modus operandi and everything else. So it was actually one person who picked up on it, or maybe a couple of people who wanted to get rid of certain folks. Whether or not police ever nabbed the Ripper, if he even existed, the Atlanta papers did not forget about him and invoked his name several times over the coming years. In March of 1913, the Constitution detailed the murder of Laura Smith, who was found with her throat cut. Like the other victims, Smith was young, of mixed race, and worked as a servant. Smith's murder was the third one that year. Then in March of 1914, three full years after the Ripper murders had begun, firefighters found notes pinned to fireboxes around the city. The notes author promised to cut the throats of all Negro women who were found on the streets after a certain hour of the night. The newspaper attributed notes to Jack the Ripper. In the coming years, in fact, when a black woman was found stabbed to death in Atlanta, the papers would point to the Ripper. Oddly, one of the final mentions of the Ripper case arose during the infamous case of Leo Frank, the Jewish businessman who was charged in the death of the 13-year-old Mary Fagan, who was ultimately lynched. Besides Frank, there was one other prime suspect, a black man named Jim Conway. In April of 1914, an out-of-town detective, Detective Dirk Burns, said that Conley not only killed Fagan, but that he was responsible for the Ripper deaths as well. Nothing came of his claims. Over time, as the memories of the murders faded, most of Atlanta grew to forget the Ripper. Seventy years later, the notion of a serial killer once again captured the city's imagination when more than 20 young black males were found murdered. Make sure you check out the episode from July 12th for the full story on the Atlanta child murders of 1979 to 1981. To this day, the truth behind the Atlanta Ripper remains a mystery. If you're a fan of dark history, don't forget to like and subscribe for more.